All right, let's uh, let's open up in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank, thank you for um, these two two books of uh, First and Second Peter, and just how uh, enlightening they were, Lord, and how uh, educational they are, uh, and motivating and convicting for us to kind of follow the advice that Peter has given. And that's uh, true again tonight. I pray, Lord, that you give me the words uh, to share with these folks uh, that you would have them know. We ask this in your name. Amen. Well, one of the most clever scams in history was perpetrated by Steve Commissar of Beverly Hills, California. And he is currently serving time in federal prison for a separate fraud case. But what Commissar would do would he would run ads in national magazines offering a solar powered clothes dryer for only $49.95. His ad stated that the scientifically proven space age clothes dryer was guaranteed to work for five years, provided there was adequate sunlight. The devices were described as uses no batteries or electricity and with free shipping included. The National Enquirer was a favorite publication for his ads. <laughs> Unsuspecting customers would pay the $49.95 to purchase the clothes driver only to receive a length of clothesline back in the mail. <laughs> exactly what I was thinking. <laughs> Tonight, we conclude our study of 2 Peter. And Peter uses the last chapter to continue his warnings against false teachers, scoffers, and those who would try and validate his teachings by deception and manipulation of his words, much like Steve Commissar did to his unsuspecting clients. Our scripture is, is passage is chapter three of 2 Peter, and I have divided it into three sections. First, or 2 Peter 3, 1 to 9, the certainty of the second coming. 2 Peter 3, 10, Christ's return. And then finally, first, 2 Peter 3, 11 to 18, how then shall we live? <clears throat> so as Christians, we live kind of in anticipation of Christ's return, right? If you think about it, that's the, the foundation of our belief. Um, he's going to come back to gather his redeemed people. He's going to uh, destroy the wicked. He's going to establish his eternal kingdom. And when he does return, he'll bring with it his reward to those who are faithfully based upon the level of commitment and faithfulness we've exhibited in our lives, right? That's a core tenet of our belief. And if that's so, excuse me, if that's so, then we know with certainty that Satan is going to do everything that he can to get the church to look away from the second coming or even to deny it as a reality, to remove it as a spiritual hope or motivation for Christians. And that's what Peter is worried about. He knows that Satan is alive and well, and he knows that he'll do anything he can to try to derail Christians, particularly newer Christians. And we see throughout the New Testament warnings against the messages of false teachers, and they deny the second coming of Christ. If you look through a lot of the New Testament, you see this wasn't only a problem for Peter's readers, but Paul also dealt with this as well. So Peter's taken great pains to assist the readers of this epistle to be able to discern false teachers and to have the theological power and the spiritual resources to overcome the influence that these false teachers would have. In chapter one, if you remember, he gave us safeguards against the false teachers, safeguards like living holy lives under the authority of the word of God safeguards like being sure that you're genuinely saved and knowing that your spiritual condition is forever. In chapter two, he described false teachers in great detail so that they would be recognizable to us. And now in chapter three, he defends the faith against their most important deception. That is that Jesus is not going to return a second time. And in the first part of the chapter, verses one through nine, he takes on the false teacher's claims that there is no second coming of Christ. He then affirms Christ will return in judgment. That's one verse in verse 10, and kind of the whole chapter pivots on that verse. And then he spends the last part of the chapter, 11 through 18, talking about how the certainty of Jesus's return should shape a believer's conduct. So if you look at it, he talks about scoffers right off the bat in verse 4. And they come and ask questions like, well, where is the promise of his coming? Or where is Jesus? All of you who said he would be back, where is he? 
Now, these false teachers know the truthfulness of the scriptures. They're not stupid people. They're not uninformed or naive. They deny what has been preached by the apostle Peter, and they do it um, to deceive others into believing there is no second coming. Now, think about what we talked about in our class just prior to Thanksgiving. False teachers were characterized by two things, sensuality and greed. So false teachers have to discredit the second coming of Christ because that frees them up from accountability. They want to pursue their sexual pleasures and feed their greedy desires without consequence. So how do they do it? Well, they come up with a number of arguments that try to get unsuspecting Christians or people that are close to becoming Christians to believe what they say. The first of those is ridicule. They would say something like, well, you're not one of those anti-intellectual people who just take everything at face value. You're not a critical thinker, are you? Or a non-critical thinker. Why would, why would this be effective? Well, think about it. In the early church, they believed that Jesus would return during their lifetimes. And the false teachers preyed on this belief. If you read 1 Thessalonians, you see that they were confused about what was happening. Christ hadn't come back, their friends were dying, and they were concerned about that they would miss the rapture. They were emotionally vulnerable. They were confused. They were naive because they didn't fully understand. So the scoffers basically would feed into that. They would say something like, well, isn't he supposed to be here by now? Maybe it's just a spiritual thing and the kingdom comes to your heart. Maybe that's what he meant. Or maybe we just die and go right to heaven. There is no second coming. The point is, it was sarcastic, it was mocking, it was belittling and demeaning the second coming and the judgment of Christ as anti-intellectual. That's what they were trying to do. They were trying to derail these people into thinking what Peter and the other apostles had taught them was incorrect or not fully correct. And again, if you remember, some of these false teachers said, well, I have a special enlightenment or I have an additional word that the apostles didn't get. So they tried to validate themselves by, by education or by being more intelligent or seeing visions. And what Peter's telling us here in chapter three is don't let them steal your hope. So the second argument they would use or that would be used is from morality. Peter said these scoffers are going to become mocking because they're following their own lusts. He tells us that right off the bat. Their course, their course of their lifestyle, being passionate in sexual desire and greed. We learned that in chapter two. They deny Christ's return because they want to pursue sexual, sensual pleasure without consequence. But what does he mean by that? Well, think about it. If there's no second coming and there's no judgment by Christ, then they're free to live the way they want. So they basically say, look, I can sin all I want because this Christ is such a great God. He has so much grace that I can sin and I'll be forgiven. So I'm a Christian just like you, but let's not get hung up on this second coming. That's the way they would pursue and try to take these people off point. And so what Peter is saying is if they want to live in a moral lifestyle, they have to get rid of accountability. So they talk about grace and they talk about the inward kingdom, and, but they don't ever talk about judgment or accountability. They don't talk about God being a righteous judge who demands holiness and who chases and sin. So I, if they eliminate accountability, they eliminate judgment. And if I position God, who is a loving God, who forgives anything that I do, then I'm fine. And that's, the, that's what you should believe as well. That was the insidiousness that these the false teachers had. So they create an accommodating philosophy to support their lifestyle. And this is what Peter is warning his reading, readers about, that they cannot do it. Conversely, if we believe in the return of Christ, it means we have an ultimate point of accountability for how we're supposed to live. And Peter wants to make sure his readers understand that. Third thing that they would talk about is kind of uniformity. They'd say something like this, where is the promise of his coming? They are saying Jesus is never going to come. Why? Be because he never has, right? We've looked back and he was supposed to be here by now. And since he isn't here, he's not coming. Right. And, and again, even ever since the fathers, right, they talk about, which are the Old Testament patriarchs, fell asleep, all continues the way it has been since creation. So they're looking backwards and saying, you know, if there was going to be a second coming, it would have happened by now. 
And since it hasn't, it's just logical to assume that it's not going to happen, right? And, and it's, everything has gone along the same way since the patriarchs. Nothing ever changes. There's continuity. So therefore, there are cataclysmic events like divine intervention and judgment just don't happen, right? That's the intellectual argument. We watched it and it went like this. And so it's always going to be like that. That's what they would try to convince people. And if the false teachers can get people to believe Jesus' second coming, he's basically cut them off from effective evangelism. We had a good discussion in our small group tonight talking about not only were they dealing with these false teachers, but they're dealing with Satan, right? Because Satan wants to do anything he can to derail Christians from sharing the good news, uh, from, from living a godly lifestyle, from, from being sanctified, right? All of those things are against what Satan wants. So you can be sure he's involved in these false teachers as well. So Peter takes a stance and he goes back now and says, well, wait a minute. These are the things that they're going to try to tell you, or these are the things that you're going to hear. I want to set your mind right and get you back on track. So he says to his readers, because you're genuine believers, you have a pure faculty for spiritual discernment. And I want to stir up that redeemed mind. In other words, he's saying, I know you're Christians. I know you've heard the truth from me. I know you, you've got salvation. Now you got to start acting like it. And you got to go back and remember what it was that I taught you when you became saved. I want you to use that new mind that Christ gave you at salvation. And I want to stimulate the truth that you already know so that your spiritual discernment will be able to understand false doctrine and it give a proper rebuttal to it. So therefore, I'm reminding you of what you already know. So he's going back and saying, don't be taken up, don't, don't be sweet talk by these people. Go back to the foundation of what I told you. And what, what is that foundation? Well, he says, let's go to scripture first. Remember the predictions of the holy prophets, he says. You need to go back and be refreshed in the Old Testament. Why? Because the Old Testament had a lot to say about final judgment. Now, as I was preparing this talk, I found so many different references in the Old Testament that I can't go through them all because we don't have time. But I'm going to give you some references. Psalm 50, Isaiah 13, Isaiah 24, Isaiah 30, 34, 51, 64, 66, Daniel 7, Micah 1, Malachi 4, Zephaniah 1, Zephaniah 3. Those were just the ones I looked up. But what Peter is saying to these people is, if you don't listen to me, go back into the Old Testament and look at how many different places these particular prophets talked about the second coming of Christ. And by the way, all unrelated to one another, all guided by the Holy Spirit to talk about this event. So he tells them, go back to scripture. He says, Christ's return for judgment is inevitable, that it says it in the Old Testament. But Peter doesn't stop there. He says, I want you to also remember the commandment of the Lord and the Savior spoken by your apostles. So now he's talking about the New Testament, right? The, the New Testament was written by the apostles under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the same Holy Spirit that inspired the prophets in the Old Testament. Listen to these facts. I found this fascinating. There are 27 books in the New Testament. 23 of the 27 refer to the Lord's return explicitly. Three of the remaining four are only one chapter, Philemon, 2 John, and 3 John. And the fourth, Galatians, speaks implicitly about the second coming. All right, you're not impressed with that. Let me give you some more facts. <laughs> In the New Testament, there's 260 chapters. In those, there are 300 references to the second coming. So Peter challenges his readers not to just listen to the scoffers, but to go to the New Testament to go to the Old Testament to verify that Jesus will return in the future. He gives another argument. He says, let's look at history. When they say no cataclysmic events have happened since the Old Testament patriarchs fell asleep or died. It, it, the way it says it in Greek, it says, it escapes their notice. They shut their eyes to the facts. There's a deliberate ignorance that they don't desire the truth so they can maintain their sinful life. What he's saying is they know the truth. They know what actually happened. They know about the cataclysmic events that take, took place that had the Lord's direct intervention in it. 
And the fact is, by the word of God, the heavens existed long ago and was formed out of water and by water. That's what Peter says. So now you start to get, okay, what is he talking about? Well, this was a cataclysmic event of God. Everything hasn't gone along the same as always. The world was formed by the word of God. Long ago, the heavens were spoken into existence by God. He created the earth. He formed it out of water and by water, the earth was some kind of watery chaos at first. He's telling them, go back and look at the creation story that you have in Genesis, right? It said that the earth or the universe was formless and an empty mass of water existing in darkness. And what did God do? By a spoken word, he created the earth out of this watery mass. He created gravity to hold the earth in place. Then he created light that wasn't there before. Then he created an expanse in the midst of the waters and let it separate the waters from the waters. That's what he says. Some waters were pulled up into the sky. He said then there was kind of a canopy that was formed. Then there was a gap. And then the water that was down on the earth was separated and actually land came out, right? And it was so good, the canopy shelter that was around the world, that the ultraviolet rays from the sun were blocked. And man lived on average back then about 900 years. Okay, so then when he's saying no cataclysmic event has happened, what about the creation story? Have you forgotten about that? But even in that perfect environment, man fell into sin and God decided to destroy the world. We know that, Genesis 6. And how did he destroy it? Well, he used the same thing that he created it from to destroy it, water. God built into his creation the tool of its destruction. And Peter is saying the world was destroyed. The world order was destroyed. It was ruined. That canopy that was above broke and water just came roaring down and out of the center of the earth. And that changed everything, right? What do people live today? 70, 80 years, not 900 years. And Peter explains that the present heaven and earth are reserved for destruction by fire and for the destruction of ungodly men. What is Peter saying? What he's saying is God's done it once. He's created and destroyed the world once. I'd call that a cataclysmic event. And he's going to do it again. And if you look at prophecy, and if you look at the New Testament, if you look at Jesus' own words, he talks about how it's going to happen. It's going to happen by fire. And it's going to be for the destruction of ungodly men. His point, the future judgment will become by the word of God, just as the past judgment came and just as creation came. His, his final two arguments are interesting as well. He argues from eternity. He says God's timing isn't there. Why is he saying that? Because these scoffers are saying, isn't it time he came back? Didn't he say he was going to come back? So Peter clarifies. He said to God, a thousand years is like a day. Look at it from God's side. From his viewpoint, time doesn't matter. He looks at time completely different. So for you to try to say 30 years in this case, and he hasn't come back, he's never coming back, it's just foolhardy, right? And that's what, that's what Peter wants people to understand. And for us to understand, even 2,000 years later, after this is written, we are still looking at it through our lens, not God's lens, where he says a 1,000 years is like a day. God has a perfect timetable for when he will come back and return, and it's not for us to know the time. The last point that Peter talks about is God's character. Well, what do we mean by his character? Well, it says this, his reason for not wishing for anyone to perish, but for all to come to repentance, it's not because the Lord is slow. It's not because he's preoccupied with something else. It's not because he's asleep. It's because he's delaying it's for patience for people to repent. God's graciousness, God's mercy is basically giving the unsaved time to find salvation. That's what Peter is telling you. So don't be misled by these false teachers who are telling you, oh, he hasn't been back since, so you know, I guess he's not coming back. That's, that's rubbish. Don't listen to him. So Peter gives a very good defense to the false teachers. He goes back at them pretty hard. But then if you, you look at, at uh, Christ's return in 10, it, it's such a, a, a triumphant statement, such a triumphant word. Peter says, the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will pass away. Earth and works will be burned up. So he's talking about what's going to happen when Christ returns. The day of the Lord, he said, will be the culmination. It's the judgment of God that comes to the end of this age. This world will, will disintegrate as we know it. It'll be a fearful time. It'll be a time of devastation and destruction. 
and the heaven and earth will be destroyed with intense heat far beyond anything that we can imagine. And if you remember when we studied Revelation, we talked about it. You'd have the rapture first, taking the church out, then the tribulation, and then the thousand-year kingdom, and then the final destruction of Satan and his followers ushering in the new heaven and the new earth. That's what Peter is now telling his readers to focus on. Not only is it going to happen, when it happens, it's going to happen like this. And only the righteous will dwell in this new heaven and earth. Satan and the ungodly will be consigned to hell. You know what he's saying? Satan's going in the fiery pit, and right behind him are going to be these false teachers. So don't be distracted. Don't be derailed in your, in your truth. Understand what is going to take place. He's coming, and he's coming on schedule. That's his encouragement in verse 10. So Peter then logically jumps to the last point, and he says, well, if all of this is true that I'm talking to you about, how then shall we live? And so his closing thoughts are a challenge to his readers. If you're looking forward to Jesus' return, shouldn't it have some implications on how you live today? That was true for his readers then, and it's true for us today. And the answer is a resounding yes. Notice it's not a question, right? It's a statement that Peter's saying. It's not if that is true, then shouldn't we believe? It's if that is true, then you should behave like this. And he uses the word the day of the Lord. That's the term of judgment and destruction, right? That's what happens when God destroys the word. But he also then talks another phrase about the eternal day of God. That's after, right? That's the eternal state of righteous glory in the presence of Christ. That's when the new heaven and the new earth is ushered in. And he's saying, that's what you should be looking forward to, right? It's going to be a devastating time on the day of the Lord. But boy, I tell you, when you get the eternal day of the Lord, you're going to live with God in your presence for eternity. That's what you want to focus on. And it's a straightforward challenge, really, to Christians to conform their lives to the reality of eternity. He's basically saying how what we live now should be consistent with our destiny as it relates to the holy conduct and godliness. That's what he says. So he's saying, OK, do a self-check on your lives. You know, are you living in a way that is consistent with where you're going? Are you having holy conduct and godliness? Now, when he talks about holy conduct, he's referring to your actions. Do your actions show that you are going to spend eternity with God? Is it the way you live, right? Is that the way you live life? What rules your behavior? Is it that belief that you're going to spend eternity with, with Christ? And then the godliness refers to our attitude, basically the spirit of reverence within me by which I live my life. So he's saying both inwardly should be pure and clean and thoughtful, right? And outwardly, your actions should show that. And it refers to the rules, what, what, what rules the heart. So Peter's challenging his readers, saying, forget these false teachers. Here's the reality of what's going to happen. And if that's going to happen, there are certain things that I want to see in your life that are going to be represented. And if you remember, his first couple books and the first two chapters of, of, of the second book lead up to this. Remember in, in chapter two, what he said, you're going to have this platform that you're going to start, but I want you to add to it. I want you to add righteousness. I want you to add knowledge. I want you to add these things because he knew false teachers were going to be there and he knew that they were going to be distracting to what he had taught them. And he wants to get them back on the track to say, no, these are the things that I want you to focus on. And it, he said, you should be living in that unbelievable grace that is going to be bestowed on you when Jesus is fully revealed in all his glory and sets up this eternal kingdom. And he gives a series of things that people should be doing if they recognize that and if that's what they believe. He said you should live with an, an attitude of expectation. Since I know I'm going to spend eternity with Christ, I should actively be expecting his coming. It should be a longing in your heart for Jesus's return. We should have an eager desire for his return, a holy eagerness, if you will. And again, I know many Christians that are saying, boy, I hope he doesn't come. I've got this wedding I got to go to. I've got this great vacation planned, right? I want to see. No, that's the wrong attitude. He wants you to live with a, an expectation of Christ is going to come back and sin is going to be conquered and no more tears. And the old heaven and earth and a sinful nature will pass away. It's a, an attitude of expectation, right? Your, your life should be lived in a manner 
so you won't be ashamed when he comes. There's no unconfessed and, and repeated sins that are in your lives. Get your life in order with the expectation that Christ is coming back. He says you should live in peace. Now, this is an interesting word. It should be a peaceful condition. What does he mean by that? To be found by Christ in peace, found by him with nothing hidden, everything brought to light that is in the innermost recesses of the human heart. He will bring to light everything we've done in our lives, whether it be good or worthless. He wants you to be thinking, to be found enjoying the peace of God that comes from a strong faith in the Lord, free from anxiety, free from fear, a peace that isn't anxious for Christ to come for fear that he will discover our sinfulness and our shame. It's a strong sense of the reality of your Christian faith and obedience so that you won't be ashamed at his coming. All is well between you and God. You know, I had a chance this past weekend to go down and spend time with my uh, grandkids. And Max, who is the three-year-old, drove this point home to me. And his mother is very insistent that there's only a limited amount of time that he gets in front of the television. But after his nap, he gets to watch 30 minutes of some type of animated cartoon. The choice of this weekend was VeggieTales. Now, I don't want to go off on a tangent, but I think there'll be a special place in hell where they're going to be forced to watch VeggieTales <laughs> over and over and over. <laughs> because he would watch the same one every time. But what his mother would say to him is, I'm going to put your brother down for a nap. You can watch one. And when this is over, then that's it. It goes off. So sure enough, she goes upstairs, puts him there. Now I'm over preparing this lesson, right? And I'm watching this. And what happens is if you don't turn on VeggieTales, it goes right into the next episode. So here's Max sitting there watching, knowing his mother had said one, but yet here he is watching the second one. And when she came down, right, unexpected, she comes around the corner and says, Max, I told you one VeggieTales. <laughs> and he did like any good Christian would do. He burst into tears, yeah. right? <laughs> Why? because he knew he had disobeyed, right? Mm -hmm. And when, when his mother showed back up, he was in sin. He was there and he was there. And this is what Peter is saying. I don't want you to be in that kind of life. I don't want you to be in sin when I return. And, and again, I think many of us will, will burst into tears when he comes because we're still caught up in some type of sinful activity. Peter's saying, I want you to be at peace. I don't want you to be caught up in type of sinful activity. He says, I want you to be pure when he comes back. Be found by him spotless and blameless. It speaks to the character and reputation of an individual. Spotless is the character, who I really am. And there are no blots in my life. Blameless, that's my reputation. That's what people think <laughs> I am. And Peter's telling his readers, they need to be pure in reality, and they need to be pure in reputation. That's what he wants them to do. And he says, live holy lives. So when the Lord comes, he finds us to be pure. Discern your sin, confess your sin, right? How do you do that? Bible study, prayer, CBS, worship, all of those things. Peter's saying, repeat over and over and over because Christ is going to come back. And that's kind of the attitude. And that's the, the atmosphere and environment he wants to find you in. He says he wants you to be evangelist, evangelistic. We're to be caught up in using the time, the energy, and the gifts that we have for the purpose of salvation for others. Remember he said God's time is perfect, and he stretched this out now in order for others to become saved. He wants salvation for all. He doesn't want to see any perish, and we have a responsibility. If we're Christians, we should be using that time to bring others to Christ as well. We're to be involved in the ministry of bringing others to him. He tells us to be discriminatory. He wrote, he said, Paul wrote many letters and these readers would have read them. Because if you remember in the New Testament, a lot of the letters that were sent to a church were shared with the other churches in the surrounding areas. He said, so you've all read Paul's letters regarding the second coming of Christ. And the point is that Paul validates and confirms what Peter is saying in his epistles. But the point that Peter's making is, it's not that easy, right? It's not that simple to understand all the prophetic issues that he writes about. And those are the people that the, the false teachers are going to target, those that are uncertain about you know, what is truth, what is life. And he says, since you know this will happen, what, what will happen? 
since you know false teachers are going to come in and try to mislead you, be on your guard. Don't get carried away with this error. Make sure you know the truth. Now, I've got a sister um, who's a few years older than me, and I love her dearly, but we have a saying in my household about Aunt Joanne. It's never in doubt, but not always right. And what, what that means is she's not bashful about giving an opinion very often on things that she's really not that aware of. And there was an example this summer where she was talking about a financial portfolio that she had, and she was talking to the table of people, and she was telling them, crazy stuff, right? I mean, it was like, you know, be invested, you know, 90% in gold. And, and I'm sitting here with 40 years of financial experience in my resume, looking at that and saying, I know that's wrong, right? That's not correct. But she's confident that she's right. And I'm saying, I know it's wrong because of my deep experience in financial services. And what Peter is saying here is you got to be discerning, right? You've got to discriminate and know what is truth. And the way you do that is you understand the word, you understand scripture, you understand what I've said, you understand what the apostle Paul has said. And he even says some of the stuff that Paul writes is hard to understand. But notice he doesn't say it's impossible to understand. He's saying you have a responsibility to figure it out, to understand it, to compare it to what I've said, to compare it to what Jesus has said. That's what he's telling them here. And then you will have the discernment to know what is true and what is false. Finally, he says, I, I want you to be mature. I want you're waiting to grow in the grace and knowledge of him. How? How do you do that? Well, you come to know him better through the study of the word. The Christian walk should be one of continued pursuit of a more intimate fellowship with Christ. I'm going to say that again. The Christian walk should be one of continued pursuit of a more intimate fellowship with Christ. That's what Peter wants, because when he gets his readers to understand that knowledge is power, knowledge is the ability to discern what is right and what is wrong, they're going to spot these false teachers, and they're going to blow them out of the way, and they're going to continue developing that re relationship and fellowship with Jesus. And by increasing the knowledge, they'll be better able to be on guard against these false teachers. And additionally, as I pursue a deeper knowledge of the fullness of Christ, I'm less able to be led astray. So remember, he talked about stable, right? The stability, the foundation is there. You can't be rocked. You can't be uncertain because you know beyond a, a shadow of a doubt what the truth is of what Jesus said he's going to do and what he will do in the future. And then finally, he says, adoration, right? That's the last way he finishes the letter. Whatever you do, you do it for the glory of God. You know what he's saying? Think back of your salvation. Think about what it means. Think about where you're going to spend eternity. You should be thanking God every day for him choosing you to spend eternity with him. Now, again, as, as we finish this book, it, it's always good to have a practical use for it. And, and I think I've shared with you before that as I was growing up, my father uh, used to read to my brother and I at night before we'd go to bed. And he would read from these books called the book of knowledge. And I've chatted with my brother and we both agree we are, are physically scarred and emotionally deficient because of some of these stories that he would read to us when we were like 11 and 10. They would just scare you to death, right? And he would come in with this book and we would have to listen to these, okay? And so I'll give an example. And I just, I thought of this, this story. It was about the province of Gavaudan, which is a city in France. Now, I'm an 11-year-old kid. I have no idea what this is, but it's the Beast of Gavaudan. Listen to this description if you're 11 or 9. <clears throat> the beast was widely rumored to resemble a wolf, except that it was not gray, but red with black streaks. It was described as being as tall as a man with a massive bushy black tail, ferocious teeth, and a chin that was always stained with blood. In a space of two years, there had been 200 attacks on humans with 113 dead and 49 injured. Sweet dreams. Sleep well. Sleep well, right? I mean, that's the story that he would read. Okay, now why do I bring this up, right? The beast was eventually shot by a hunter called Jean Chastel on June 19, 1767. After this, the attack stopped for good. As the story goes, Chastel had fashioned a silver bullet, which he had the local priest bless as a bullet set apart for God's work, a silver bullet to protect God's people. I like the concept of the power of the 
the silver bullet to ward off false teachers. And I would argue that Peter has given us three silver bullets to ward off false teachers. Here's what they are. First is God's word. God's word is the ultimate and final authority. It's the foundation of truth upon which we should base all other information. Any and all teachings and knowledge presented by an external source must be scrutinized through the lens of scripture. If it can't be verified by scripture or doesn't align with scripture, then it's false, period. And therefore, we must always be on guard. Some of the most damning influences today masquerade as truth and only contain subtle distortions or mistruths. So the first bullet is know your scripture and know it beyond just kind of glancing at it or, or skimming it, dig into it. Dig into it and understand what it means and what it means for your life. The second bullet that he gives us is prayer. Pray that the spirit of God opens your eyes to understand and interpret his truth accurately. The power of God in you can and will reveal his truth to you as you digest and wrestle with the words you read. Ask him for guidance, wisdom, and discernment as you read. In faith, he will re reveal his truth to you. Understanding scripture doesn't come by osmosis. It comes by diligent study and the enlightenment by the Holy Spirit. And if you don't understand something, what Peter's telling you to do is you pray. And God isn't someone who's going to sit there and ignore the prayer of a righteous man. He wants all to be saved. And the best thing he can do is for you to understand it so you can share it with others. So that's the second. And then the third silver bullet is worship. He wants us to remember all that he's done for us and that we'll spend eternity in heaven with him. I want you to think of those three bullets. If every day you were using them, not only to ward off false teachers, but also to edify yourself and your lives so that when Christ does come back, he's going to find you in the state that Peter describes in this book. And these are the things that he keeps driving his readers back to in order for them to become more like Christ. And I would argue that these things apply to us today, just as much as they did to Peter's readers back in 63 AD. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, these words of, of Peter. And Lord, just six months after he finished this letter, he was crucified and spent eternity with you. And he knew the urgency that he had, that he wanted to take care of his flock. And Lord, those words today are just as impactful for us. And as we think about them, as we marinate on them, as they, they, they come over our lives. We trust, Lord, that, that you will challenge us and convict us to go after these things the same way Peter encouraged his readers to do so long ago. We ask this in your name. Amen.